farm, family, community. This is Midwest Farm Weekly. Good morning, I'm Melaine Wells and welcome to Midwest Farm Weekly. In your news headlines, the first corn is now in the ground in our state. It's all thanks to that burst of warm weather we had last week. That early 1% means planting started 12 days ahead of last year and three days ahead of average. Farmers are starting to fall a bit behind an average year when it comes to tillage, though there are fewer farms working the soil in the spring due to cover crop and no-till practices. Winter wheat condition is at 65% good to excellent condition, improving statewide. The snowmelt is leaving some farmers with giant ponds where they hope to plant crops. Some farmers in our region have dealt with drought in recent years, so they are hoping that the flooding at least leaves behind a rich, moisture-packed soil for the rest of the growing season. A lot of vegetable growers start their seeds indoors and then move the plants to the field when weather allows. Mid-April is the target for those growers to get seeds in the ground because there are some varieties that don't do well starting indoors. There are some things that benefit from just going into the ground. So something like a carrot, um, radishes, if we tried to transplant them, we'd have, uh, you know, a weird looking carrot. Many of our local seasonal farm markets begin a month from now. And thanks to the indoor growing operations, they expect shoppers will have a lot to choose from. Farm equipment, of course, continues to evolve to address labor shortages and rising costs. At the recent WPS Farm Show, Vanderloop Equipment showcased a unit that they upcycled. This forage chopper was past its useful life, so it was converted into a self-propelled manure pump. The overhaul is expected to extend the machine's useful life by about 10 years. It has everything that a manure hauler would need, from a flow meter to a PTO, even an air compressor and a pressure washer. The pump can be paired with their new autonomous tractor system, allowing operators to significantly cut down on the number of people needed to pump. Well, for instance, you would have uh, the operator of this pump up in the command center and he would run the trucks and the dumpster and the pump and then all those functions. And he would also run the applicator tractor. You have one operator to run the whole operation. So the pumping, the trucking, the, the, the line maintenance, the drag line, the toolbar with one person. Vanderloop Equipment says this driverless tractor solution will be available for use this summer. Kiwanee County Agri Career Days returned after taking a few years off. Seventh and eighth grade students from five Northeast Wisconsin school districts had the chance to explore a wide range of careers connected to agriculture. A lot of uh, people in our community obviously see the farms and um, know that they raise cows and they drive tractors, but they don't understand or sometimes realize the vast array of careers that are actually involved with agriculture. And ag has a large impact in Kiwani County with 2,300 jobs tied to the industry. Ag contributes around $80 million to the economy in that region alone. Speaking of, Kiwani County farmers and business leaders got together to celebrate dairy. This first time event at the fairgrounds featured plenty of dairy products, including grilled cheese and ice cream. This was also a chance to highlight the Breakfast on the Farm host family, the Salentines. Kiwani County's Breakfast on the Farm is on Father's Day, June 18th. I was honored to host the event. Well, Jeremy Hansen here from Fox Valley Technical College for Life on the Farm. And we're at the National Weather Service again today. And joining me again is Roy Eckberg. Roy, thanks so much for a return visit to Life on the Farm. Oh, you're so, welcome. Yep, Roy, tell me a little bit about what we were doing this afternoon. Okay, we first started out doing a weather balloon here at the office. We launch them twice a day. Uh, this time of year, it's 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. During the winter time, it's 5 a.m. and 5 p.m. Uh, we fill the balloon with hydrogen, uh, gets to a certain weight limit. Then we tie a parachute and a radio sun to the balloon. The radio sun has a thermistor, which measures temperature. Uh, there's a pressure sensor inside the uh, instrument. And then as the balloon goes up, uh, the satellite calculates its position, and that's how it calculates wind speed and direction as it goes through the atmosphere. The balloon will get up to about 100,000 feet before it bursts and then it parachutes back to ground. 
Yeah. And Roy, you know, I was I was surprised when you said hydrogen. You know, why don't you use helium as an example? That's that was my impression when I got here today. Uh, hydrogen is cheaper and it's more available uh, than helium, and that's what most offices use. There's a few offices in the weather service, like Tallahassee, that uses helium. Right, and you know, right, right by the airport here, do you need any special permission or clearance from the airport at all when you launch a weather balloon? Uh, we do, uh, we call the, the airport tower, saying we're launching a balloon at 615. We've done this for 50 years, so they say yes. The only time we would not be able to launch a balloon is if the president is in town, there's uh, national security issues, right. and we have to get, wait for clearance huh, when that occurs. And then, Roy, what do you do with that data once it's up in the air? I mean, is it coming directly here, or, or how do you get that data? Uh, the data comes back here. It's transmitted back to our office computer, which is solely uh, for upper air. That data is ingested. It's coded up and sent to Washington, D.C. That data is used for the computer weather models. You can actually look at our upper air sounding on our website once the balloon is complete. So it's go mainly for the weather models, and that helps us determine precipitation, temperatures, precipitation type. Well, and that's my next question, Roy. You know, last fall, we, we kind of gave like a winter outlook, and surprising how, how accurate your winter outlook actually was. You know, what are you seeing for the spring and the summer? Uh, we were very active weather pattern, like you saw in California with all the rain, and the phenomenal snow amounts in the Sierra Nevada range there, I think I heard five, 600 inches, right. if not more. That same pattern uh, kind of influenced our weather. We started out very quiet and mild December, January, mm -hmm. but once we turned February, it got very active about the middle of the month into early April with quite a bit of snow. We went from way below normal snowfall to well above in a span of probably six weeks. Right. So we've been uh, very busy, and now we're seeing the ramifications of the deep snowpack. Uh, we've issued last night, I think, 29 river statements and flood warnings. And for me, I think that is a record number of statements to issue. So it's, we, we felt the impacts. Looking ahead, uh, we've had this recent warm spell here in mid-April, but it's supposed to turn back more typical of mid to late April standards. Yes, unfortunately. Unfortunately. Uh, we're still looking for the March through May period to be wetter than normal. Uh, as we head into the summer month, uh, uh, June, July, and August, we're looking for maybe a, better, a slightly better chance for above normal precipitation. And then temperatures, there's pretty much uh, equal chance for above, below, or near normal. The climate models are not really showing right, any right. clear trends. Right, and so it makes your job much harder then. It does. Right. So, Roy, you know, thank you so much for inviting me up here again today. This was absolutely fascinating watching the weather balloon um, go up and get prepared. So thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. So for Life on the Farm, I'm Jeremy Hansen. Are you ready to increase your farm's income and cut back on expenses so you can be confident in the financial future of your farm? There's an upcoming event that is focused on just that. We're talking cash flow. Polly Paul from Complete Management Consulting will be a presenter, and we welcome Peggy Coffeen from Uplevel Dairy. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Peggy, let's talk about the impetus of this event. Cash flow is always something we need to keep an eye on. Why have this event? Yeah, so Polly and I both speak to a lot of dairy farmers in our line of work. Me through Uplevel Dairy and the Uplevel Dairy Podcast, Polly through Complete Management management consulting and one of the big things that we know and hear often right now is the increase in the cost of inputs, the increase in interest rates and inflation and all of those things combined with these lower farm incomes expected for 2023. We know that on the top of dairy farmers minds right now is how can they increase their cash flow so that 2023 doesn't have to be a detrimental year to the financial viability of their farming businesses. And that's why we also know that the most aggressive forward-thinking producers are constantly seeking ways to be able to do that. And so are the consultants and the egg lenders that are their advisors and assets to their team. And so what better way 
to uh, teach people how to increase their income and reduce their expenses by not just telling them, but showing them. And that's why Polly and I are teaming up to put together what you need to know to cash flow. And this is going to be a farm tour and a workshop to okay. follow on April 25th, next Tuesday in Malone, Wisconsin, where we'll start at Levy Dairy Farm mm -hmm. and then move over to Leclerc Creamery for lunch and discussion. Polly, I love that these are real world examples. These are not let's suppose scenarios. These are actual farms you've worked with. Why is that a critical component? So I think um, it's really critical for people to see really what, what has transpired from the, the first day we stepped foot on the farm mm -hmm. till today. We've been there going on six years now. So I think it's really important for everybody to see really how good the dairy is being managed right now. It's important for producers to understand there's no such thing as gone too far, right? In your world, you, you can intervene and you can help operations that are really struggling. Yeah, there's, there's always a way. There's always a way to, to figure out how you can cash flow and how you can you know, survive in a, mm -hmm. in a tough market. What are some of the first key points you hope to get across to someone, whether they're sitting down at this meeting or you're sitting down to work with them for the first time? What are those high level points you always want to get out? So the first thing I always tell everybody is, you know, keep an open mind. Um, there's, there's always um, things that we're going to suggest and, and you got to keep an open mind for change. Mm. Change is the toughest thing for every, mm. every dairy we get to. But certainly if what you're doing isn't working, change is going to be a necessary part of that solution. Correct. Right? Correct. Peggy, talk about bringing farmers together for an event like this. Perhaps when it's a rising tide and we're all working together, you maybe feel like you're, you're not so alone in the industry. Yeah, I think there's a couple components. One of them is the feeling of not being alone, as you said, but also how can we all be better together? Mm -hmm. And that's where, as I mentioned before, this event is for dairy producers, but also those that are the trusted people that have a seat at the table with multiple dairy farmers and the ones that have that position of being able to help the best become better or help those that are struggling to be in a better position. And so by bringing people all into the room and being able to see, walk through a farm that has actually made changes, as Polly said, change is hard, but really show people, these are the changes that you made in the feed center. These are the changes we made in the barn. These are the changes in the milking parlor that help this particular dairy increase their milk production, lower their somatic cell count, have zero employee turnover. And wow. at the end of the day, a farm family that's able to sleep at night and feel good about their future, that's what we all want. And that's what Polly and I both are committed to seeing as the difference we want to make in the dairy industry. And those are the people that we are inviting to attend yeah. this farm tour and workshop to help others that are in belief and in alignment with that same cause. Well, if you can do all of those things, my goodness, you are hired. Here yeah. is one more look at all of the details. You do need to register to attend this event. We have the link for you on our website, wearegreenbay.com. Navigate to the Midwest Farm section from the News tab on our homepage. Thanks to you both. Good morning, I'm Storm Team 5 meteorologist Alexis Staniak. We're still talking about snowpack even at the end of April heading into May. As of Thursday, about an inch still left on the ground further north of Green Bay, even into central and western Wisconsin with that storm that we saw this past week. Into the next 10 days or so, I still think there's a chance for some lingering light flurries to move through. It doesn't look to be too bad further north and west of Green Bay, so north of Minneapolis are likely to see a little bit more snow cover as well as over to our west in Denver. Uh, we are going to be much warmer. So it doesn't look like too much snow to come through. A little bit cooler this weekend, 48 for Saturday, 47 on Sunday. Then we start to see those temperatures back into the 50s again, 51 on Monday, uh, 50 by Tuesday. And then by the end of next week, temperatures creeping up uh, closer to 60. But we are still below average for where we should be for this time of year. The Climate Prediction Center has put us in this below average category heading into the next 8 to 14 days. So expect that cooler air as we wrap up April and even head into May. The good news is, is that we're sitting right where we should be our precipitation wise, just off to our south and west where they're below a normal and then down further to our south and east still above normal for this time of year. This is kind of what we're seeing for rain the next 10 days. It doesn't look to be too much to come through, maybe about a half of an inch here in Green Bay, just over a half of an inch in Omaha, very below where they should be in Bismarck, but this will continue to help the drought. As of Thursday, we are well above where we should be for this time of year, about three inches above uh, here in Green Bay, about four and a half over in Wausau, five and a quarter where we should be above for this time of year in Rhinelander and about four inches in Milwaukee. Stay with us, more Ag News coming up after the break. May is Beef Month, and you can celebrate by signing up for the Burgers and Buns.
Wisconsin's Fun Run. Caitlin Riley is here from the Wisconsin Beef Council with all of the juicy details. That's is right. Is that a good use of that word? Yeah, <laughs> I love that. Juicy. Who doesn't think of a juicy burger when they're thinking about May, the kick yeah. kickoff to grilling season? and. What better way to celebrate than with our Burgers and Buns Fun Run? It's going to be at the Farm Wisconsin Discovery Center here coming up Saturday, May 20th. Talk about the event as a whole because this has really grown in participation. It really has. You know, my first year with the Wisconsin Beef Council, 2021, fresh off of COVID, and we did a virtual only event, still donating our proceeds to a charity. The next year, we listened to feedback and decided to add this in-person component. And so we had the virtual run and the in-person at Farm Wisconsin, and it was phenomenal. I was impressed with the amount of very involved runners yeah. who should up using this as a warm up to the Green Bay Marathon. Well, sure. And we offered free burgers for those who did participate in the race and then they have the chance to get a free entrance to the Farm Wisconsin Discovery Center. So this year we're making the race a part of Beef Fest wow. at the Farm Wisconsin Discovery Center. So taking it to that whole next level of yes, come here, get active with your family, do a 5K and then enjoy your free beef hot dog or beef burger for participating. And we're looking to incorporate a lot more educational opportunities. Okay. You know, having a nutritionist there, talking about what it takes to feed those livestock that are turned into high quality mm. protein for families. We have a meat processor who says that he's willing to come down and show us how to make beef sausage. So if you wow. are a hobbyist and cool. want to learn to be able to do that at your own home, he's going to be there to do that hands-on demonstration. We're going to have folks there talking about that animal care, animal welfare. So looking for a farmer who might be willing to bring some beef animals so if there's anyone in the area that wants to volunteer, but this is just a great way to get out, celebrate, say thank you to everyone along that beef industry supply chain while also giving back to those in need. So all of our proceeds from the race will be donated to Feeding Wisconsin great. and that'll be used to help buy beef for those families in need. And last year it was $4,500 that we were able wow. to donate. That's an incredible impact from a, a one day event. No doubt that you're working year round to make that impact as well. Can we walk, run, stroller? Any okay. of the above, right? And we are starting our walkers a little bit earlier just to kind of keep the flow going for the award ceremony. So show up at nine o'clock. That's when registration opens. Great. The walk starts at 10, the race at 1030. And you can find all those details at beeftips.com. And find some good recipes while you were there as well. And people, as mentioned, should plan to spend the entire day at Farm Wisconsin. We're going to take one more look at all of the details for the Burgers and Buns Fun Run to celebrate May Beef Month. You can register at beeftips.com. The event itself is on May 20th. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. We are getting closer to crowning a new Alice in Dairyland. Midwest Farm continues to introduce you to the women in the running, and that includes Ashley Hagenow. Good morning to you. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. Well, congratulations on making it thus far in a, in a very tough process. Yes, of course. This process all started back in January, if you applied, in early February when um, preliminary interviews took place. And it's been a wild ride since then. <laughs> it's been so exciting, full of growth and lo new learning opportunities. So, so excited to be here with you today to talk more about what that journey has been about so far. And for you, passion for agriculture is something that started pretty early on. Yes. Give me a little background on your involvement in this industry. Yes, so I grew up very active in 4-H and FFA and I exhibited various livestock species across the state of Wisconsin including dairy cattle, horses, rabbits, and even cats actually a few years okay. and also gained many valuable public speaking skills with dairy cattle judging and serving as a state FFA officer and certainly along the way made so many great connections with friends and mentors in the industry. Which I think is so unique about the Alice process because so many of you know each other. Talk about the family that has really risen up around this operation. Yes, you're so right. When we had our press briefing back in the middle of March, it was so cool to see who we were all running alongside as the six top candidates because a lot of us know each other mm -hmm. through 4 H or FFA or the Ferris of the Fair program or other organizations and you really do create a bond over the top candidate journey so I'm really excited to see everyone again back in person for the finals in just a few short weeks from now. What is it about the position of Alice that excites you? Oh, great question. So what I love about the Alice and Dairyland program is that Alice truly serves as the connection point to all of Wisconsin's diverse and abundant agricultural industry whether it's at a local or county fair if it's at an industry event, if it's even at a grocery store handing out sure. samples, Alice serves as that true connection point for Wisconsin's agricultural industry. 
And after being able to connect with consumers, that's where education and storytelling can really take place about all that goes into our agricultural industry here in the state. You and I were chatting about your passion for working with farmers and that yes. you get really excited at the innovations and getting to share their story. Oh, certainly. What's so unique about Wisconsin agriculture and agriculture in general is the new technologies and innovative ideas and solution that farmers across our state and nation are truly at the helm of, which help to make productions more efficient, increase yield, and really make the lives of farmers able to be more sustainable within the industry. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I'm glad I'm not a judge. <laughs> we are going to crown a new Alice in Dairyland next month in Walworth County. Follow along at aliceindairyland.com. Best of luck to you. Thank you so much for having me.